Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Wendy Cover, a coral biologist. Today, we're going to talk about coral health. So let's get into it. Wendy, can you tell us about what kind of role coral play in the health of the oceans and what is it that the coral actually do and tell us, are they living? Just tell us more about the coral. Sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, corals are alive. They're animals. Um, they're really rather unique animals. And that um, if you think of sort of the old school animal vegetable mineral distinction, in a sense, they're actually all three of those. They're technically animals. Um, they have tentacles um, that capture food, sting food, and bring it into their mouth and digest it. Um, but there are many, many of those different little polyps on a colony of corals. So they're a colonial animal. Um, and they secrete a skeleton. So that's where the mineral part comes in. Um, so they have different shapes. They might be branching, they might be mounding, all different types, many, many species and growth forms. And um, the vegetable part of the equation comes in because they have tiny little symbiotic algae that live within their cells. They're single celled algae. Um, they're called zooxanthellae. And those little algae are friendly to the coral and they photosynthesize and some of the food that the algae make goes to the coral. Um, so they get a home and the coral gets some food. Um, so they're really incredible organisms that build these skeletons that then make whole huge reefs all together um, over time. And so all of the barrier reefs offshore where the waves are breaking, um, the, from the Great Barrier Reef to even just smaller um, reefs offshore. And they create the coral sand, the beautiful white sands of Hawaii. Um, it's actually incredible like how many functions corals have within tropical ecosystems. Um, they're really important for storm protection from waves, um, from their structure. And the structure of the reefs also provide homes for all kinds of other animals, for all that incredible diversity that we see on coral reefs. Corals are providing the structure and the homes for those fish and invertebrates and other creatures that live on them. So when is the most common time for these coral to feed? Because oftentimes you're maybe snorkeling or diving and you're not necessarily seeing them feeding. When would be a good time if someone wanted to see these corals feed? When would be a good time for them to observe something like this? Or is it very hard to observe that? Yeah, if you go diving or snorkeling at nighttime, you're much more likely to see a coral with its tentacles extended. Um, it varies a little from species to species, but yeah, they tend to extend their tentacles at night because that also tends to be when the food they want to capture, the zooplankton, is most prevalent. Um, they come up at night, and so more likely to see those tentacles at night. Generally, during the day, the tentacles are retracted, but you can still see that correlate structure. Um, sometimes they're very, very small, um, but where that polyp resides in the coral lots of them on the colony. Nice. And how do they get all the colors that they have? There are many different colors. Are there have? are many different colors, different shades of brown and green, sometimes pinkish or bluish. Um, mostly those colors come from that symbiotic algae that I mentioned, their zooxanthellae. So there are many different types of zooxanthellae that the corals can um, bring into themselves um, to live symbiotically with them. Um, and usually uh, it'll vary by species, but there, even within a species, there can be many different types of zoos and belly um, and slightly different colors that the corals can have as well. So mostly that color is coming from that symbiotic algae. And how long have you been studying coral? Uh, I started studying coral in college. Um, on a foreign study program <laughs> and uh you know i i first started doing it for work um 
not long after college when I joined the Peace Corps and I was working on the small island nation of Niue um, in the South Pacific. Um, and I was working for the fisheries department there and um, it was a really amazing experience. How about, didn't you study coral here in Hawaii? Can you tell the viewers about that experience? Yeah, so for my dissertation work, I worked out on Midway Atoll, which is way out in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands um, in what is now Papahanaumokuakea National Monument, Marine National Monument. And um, I looked at species interactions on the reef. So basically like how herbivores, which are certain types of fish or urchins that eat algae, um, big macro algae, not the little symbiotic algae I was talking about earlier, but big algae that you can see that grows in the reef. Um, the herbivores will eat that, and that can actually be a great thing for the corals because that macroalgae can overgrow and smother the corals if there's too much of it. And so those herbivores are really, really helpful for the corals. They serve a really important function on the reef. So how is the reef affected when there are no herbivores anymore, I guess, you know, with overfishing and everything, how does that affect the reef? It's a big issue, definitely. Um, it's one of the three really big issues affecting coral reefs. Um, because those herbivores are so important in keeping the algae grazed down. And on a healthy coral reef, you really won't see any, hardly any macroalgae, maybe one species Podina somewhat regularly, but for the most part, you really don't see it. A healthy coral reef has lots of hard corals, maybe some soft corals some sponges, but not so much algae. Um, and that's because the herbivores are grazing that algae down. Um, and if you overfish the herbivores, which has happened in a lot of places now, um, one really notable story um, that happened in Jamaica, uh, the fish herbivores, mostly parrot fishes and sur surgeon fishes, they got fished out. Um, and the final remaining herbivores, which were an urchin, the long-spined urchin, those got hit by a disease and they got wiped out. And that after that, a hurricane struck and wiped out a bunch of the corals. And what grew in its place because there weren't any fish herbivores anymore was a lot of macroalgae. And the corals just couldn't recover with all of that macroalgae there. And so there was what they call a phase shift from a coral dominated system to an algae dominated system. Um, and so that's sort of the biggest concern with overfishing is that when you lose that really important grazing function, um, you can actually like completely change what lives on the reef when there are other disturbances or things that go on. How can you control the overfishing though? I mean, I guess you can have some regulations, but here a lot of people spearfish too. I mean, how do you think mm -hmm. that impacts it? Is that less of an impact? Is it more of an impact? You know, because I know the spearfishers, they might be more mindful of taking fish that you know aren't reproducing for us or so I've heard but mm -hmm. I don't really know how that affects the reef yeah well first of all fishing regulations can have a really big and important impact and they have in Hawaii um, in a lot of places um, there are some no-take areas where fish have recovered really strongly there are some areas that protect herbivores specifically herbivorous fishes like parrotfish and surgeon fish and those have recovered really well um, and are you know doing their their important duties on the reef and um but with regard to spearfishing it's an interesting question because spearfishing is very specific like the person is down there and you can target exactly what you want um, and avoid what you don't want to catch um, so that can be great um, you know, if implemented in a, in a thoughtful manner. Um, spearfishing also can just make it really easy to get a lot of fish, especially, um, for example, a lot of people, at least in the past, would spearfish at night um, when the parrotfish are sleeping and they kind of 
just hang out in one spot under a coral or something resting. It's super easy to go down, spear them. Um, and so it's almost like too easy <laughs> to get the fish and to wipe out the fish in an area. And so that's where you can kind of get into trouble um, with spear fishing is if there's kind of too much of it because it is in some senses an easier way of targeting fish that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Yeah. Um, and but it's interesting because when I was in Peace Corps on Niue, um, there are a lot of cultural traditions that they have going way back. And interestingly, one of them is that spearfishing is taboo. Um, you're not allowed to do it on the island at all. It's a long-standing tradition. I don't know how far back it goes. Um, but one really interesting consequence of that that I noticed when living and diving there was that the fish are not afraid of you at all. Like there are huge parrotfish that are just like swimming right really close to you, munching on the reef. Like they have no fear whatsoever. And then, you know, I go to some other place where there is spear fishing or especially that had been fished recently and the fish take off as soon as you're there and sometimes like <laughs> they're truly really terrified um, so it's, it's really interesting how like, that had sort of totally unanticipated effects I would never have thought about that but it can also make sort of a difference for divers and snorkelers and the experience of being on a reef in terms of how afraid or unafraid the fish are fish are kind of kind of smart actually after all yeah they are <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about the two other factors that you kind of mentioned that was the first factor uh the fishing and then talk about the two other factors that are affecting the coral reefs if you could yeah absolutely um there's sort of the big three they call it um and that's climate change pollution and overfishing. Um, and so we talked about overfishing a bit already. Um, I can talk about the other two if you want as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so with climate change, um, things are getting warmer. And we know that, and the oceans as well are getting warmer. So one of the biggest problems for corals is that they are really used to a particular temperature range and when those temperatures get hotter than that for an extended period of time it's very stressful to them and to that relationship with their symbiotic algae and so something happens called coral bleaching which you may have heard of um and that's basically where the coral turns white. It's like it's been bleached by bleach. There's no bleach involved, but <laughs> that's why it's called coral bleaching. Um, so the coral turns white, and we already talked about how the color of the coral comes from that symbiotic algae that it has within itself. And so it turns white because it expels that algae because of the stress, like that relationship is no longer beneficial for the two. And so it gets rid of the algae and it becomes a bleached coral. And if the conditions don't cool down pretty quickly, the coral will die um, because it needs to have that symbiotic algae to live for a long period of time. Um, and so that warming is a really big, big problem for coral reefs, especially because it's projected to have, we're projected to have more and more warming over time um, and coral bleaching events are getting much more frequent worldwide. And this is a, a worldwide issue, not just yeah. in Hawaii. Um, yeah, affecting corals everywhere. So yeah, climate change in terms of warming, also in terms of acidification. And I don't even know if we want to go into that, but um, <laughs> that is another issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then pollution. Um, pollution is a really big issue for coral reefs. Um, and there's sort of, I guess, four main types of pollution that can come into reefs. You can get sedimentation coming in so that's like soils clays 
any kind of land sediment runoff um, coming into the water. Um, and the problem with that is that that will basically like smother the corals. It can outright kill them if there's enough of it. It can also just decrease the light um, that's available to the corals because of all those sediments in the water, suspended sediments. And so that makes it harder for the algae to photosynthesize and give the coral food. Um, so sedimentation is a problem for reefs. Um, also nutrients. So nutrients like phosphates, nitrates, um, which you find a lot in fertilizers. You find them naturally as well in the sediments, but you know, especially in fertilizers from agriculture, um, from sewage, yeah. um, from agricultural animal waste. Um, so all those things will bring nutrients into the water. And nutrients we know are great for plants, right? That's why we put them on our crops. Um, but the plants on the reef are that the macroalgae that I was talking about earlier that compete with the corals, right, for space. And so you're basically feeding that macroalgae and encouraging its growth instead of the corals' growth. Um, and it makes it harder for the corals to grow, to recover for the little, the young little coral recruits to come in and grow. Um, so nutrients are a problem. So what have we done? We've done sedimentation, we've done nutrients, um, chemicals, chemical pollution is definitely an issue. Um, it's probably one of the least studied things, but there are a variety of chemicals from herbicides and pesticides to petroleum products um, and things that can get onto the reef and how about the yes. sunscreen? Because that was uh, Stressed out. a lot. Yeah, um, sunscreen is one of those chemicals. So chemical sunscreen um, and those chemicals, and they're still studying all of them, but at least one or two have been shown already to kill corals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so using like a mineral sunscreen instead or a rash guard um, is really Think great. Oxide. Yeah, the zinc oxide mineral sunscreens, yeah, are a lot more reef friendly. So those are the ones that will be labeled reef friendly. If you see a sunscreen labeled reef friendly, like that's why, because the other sunscreens have those chemicals that can harm corals. And can you tell us, you know, I noticed that when I went to America Samoa, American Samoa to visit you, that the the coral reef is a lot nicer there. There's more colors than we have here in Hawaii. Do you think mm -hmm. it's just because our population is larger here and more trash, more runoff, or mm -hmm. is it just because it's a different location? Is it the age of the island? What affects the reef, I guess? What other factors are there that are- Yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting observation. And I think, I mean, Probably a large part of what you're seeing is just the fact that Samoa has a much higher diversity of corals naturally than Hawaii does. And that's simply because of geography, because it's a lot closer to the center of coral diversity, which we call the Coral Triangle, which is around Indonesia area. Mm -hmm. um, and so the further you get away from that center of diversity, the less um, the fewer corals there are, the fewer different types of corals on a reef. Um, and so Hawaii has less diversity, so it's less likely to have less likely to have all the, you know, the different colors and different coral types. Um, it can still have good coral cover. Um, and also because of that isolation that Hawaii has, it actually has more endemic species um, of corals and of fish and invertebrates, which is really neat. So endemic species are found nowhere else on Earth. Oh, that's um, so that's kind of a really cool thing about Hawaii's reefs is they're about, you know, 20% or so endemic species. Um, so yeah, they just have kind of some different things going on. And, you know, in Samoa, there are some absolutely gorgeous reefs that have been well protected and haven't been subject to pollution and other problems. And there are reefs that have been subject to pollution and that and bleaching and disease and that have been mostly killed off. So it's a mix. Um, and I think you see that mix in Hawaii too. Like there are some places that are pretty well cared for um, and are doing well and other places that are really, really struggling.
I know there wasn't there, I think you told me there was a problem with overfishing in America Samoa because so there weren't um, as many fish there. How did that affect mm -hmm. their coral reef? Yeah, um, it's interesting that you noticed that. And yeah, it's it's true there has been um, a fair amount of, of overfishing. You see it in a lot of places. Um, and yeah, it's it's hard to say exactly how it's affected the reef. In some places, the reef has still managed to be pretty good, even though it's fairly overfished, because it those areas don't really have any nutrient input or pollution coming in um, and haven't been hit by any major disturbances, like a hurricane or something. Um, but in other places, yeah, um, the reefs actually have been taken over by algae. Um, and that's kind of been a combination of the overfishing and the nutrients together, just encouraging that algal growth and not having enough herbivores to, um, to get rid of it. And so we've absolutely seen that in American Samoa in certain areas um, because of the overfishing. And so, yeah, it's, it can happen in more areas too. We're really hoping it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. And how about the way, I mean, it must affect when you kill like the, the predator at the top of the food chain. I mean, if there's a lot of sharks being killed, how does that affect the coral reef? Mm -hmm. Yeah, having predators in an ecosystem, in any ecosystem is really important. Um, they tend to target, you know, more diseased or weaker individuals, um, and that tends to keep the whole system healthier. Um, so having predators in general um, is indicative of a healthier ecosystem. Um, everything just functions better when you have those predators there. A lot of the weaker individuals, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're out of time and we have oh to my gosh. now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Wendy Cover. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of our crew at Think Tech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you on June 23rd for more of Healthy Planet on Think Tech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. Our next show will be about vegan nutrition and nutrition education for medical students with Dr. Michael Clapper. If you have ideas for the show, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com for more information on my projects, including future show guests. Um, anyway, uh, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Thank you for watching. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.